Um, so thanks a lot for um, coming along, Jeffrey. As, as, as uh, many of you might have heard, it's about 4 a.m. over in Texas where Jeffrey lives. So a big effort for him to come out and, and see us out here in Perth. So thank you very much, mate. No, oh, happy um, to. Glad to have you. I mean, thanks for having me. You're welcome, mate. Very welcome. Um, uh, to intro, Jeff, I'll start with um, uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, for sure, um, when I was in the thick of some Azure DevOps work um, and me and a colleague, um, and uh, it, I'd done some DevOps before that, but this was, we were really getting stuck into it. And like, um, my colleague came to me one day and said, oh, you know, Tim, we're out hunting for information forever. He said, oh, I've heard this really good podcast this guy named Jeff, Jeffrey Clamo. I said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll give that a whirl, you know. So, um, and, yeah, went out and uh, listened to Jeffrey's podcast and quickly soaked up about 10 or 15 of them, I think, Jeffrey. <laughs> um, and, yeah, ever since then, I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts, but I always come back and check in what's happening on, on your site, mate, and listen to a few of them. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's uh, ever since then. And, when, uh, and then that, that same colleague actually came to me at some point and said, oh, Jeffrey's coming out to, to uh, meet up places. And, all oh, right, that's it. I'm going for it. So, yeah, and, and here we are. Um, so, Jeffrey is um, uh, your chairman now, not CEO anymore, I, I saw, um, of uh, Clear Measure um, and the Chief Architect, which is a. Uh, uh, do you want to explain what Clear Measure is, Jeffrey? Sure. Um, so, it's a company uh, headquartered in Austin, Texas, but we're kind of spread out over the United States. Uh, and it's a software architecture company. And, and our goal is to empower our clients, .NET development teams to be self-sufficient so that they can do more internally and move faster and deliver quality and, and um, increase the stability of their software system. So um, we, we compete against software consultants and software project outsourcers by actually enabling companies that have, that have, that have hired developers internally to do more of their projects in-house and have to outsource less. And there's, there's the large companies, which are, are a different beast, but there's so many mid-sized companies that have decided to hire developers and staff internal development uh, teams, but they're not yet to the point where they have architects of their own and layers of, of technology management on, up and down like the large enterprises have. So they're in this phase where uh, we, we enjoy helping them out and, and helping their teams be more effective. Okay, that's actually interesting. We're, we're, I'll have to have a chat with you later on because we're in a similar sort of position with the larger companies, but I'm saying to my partner, it's happening at the mid-level now too, you know, like there, there's more options for companies. There's DevOps happening in more places. Um, so yeah, okay, that's clear measure. Um, uh, on top of clear measure as well, uh, um, Jeffrey has also written a book on uh, .NET DevOps for Azure, um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so, yeah, best practices in .NET DevOps for Azure. So, um, over to you, Jeffrey. Take it away. All right, fantastic. I'll, I'll cool. share my screen if I have permissions. I think I do. I have to give it to you. There we go. There we go. Everybody, oh, just a quick quick one for everyone. Um, uh, just please try to make sure you're on mute so we don't get all that background noise. Um, and any questions you have, just put them in the sidebar. Uh, I'll put them in the chat section and we'll all come on as a question master at the, after Jeffrey's talk's finished and we'll uh, cover off all the questions then, okay? All right, and it should be coming through. A full, a full, full screen slide coming through? Yes, I can see it, it's all good. Okay, awesome. So uh, let me get get going here. So one of the one of the main uh, elements when when folks talk about DevOps or they talk about the tool, the so the software package of of Azure DevOps, is the why, and um, and, and it's it's really simple when you map out your software delivery process and then automate it, you end up delivering more and uh, you absolutely love the results. Um, and, and there's a, there's a tends to be a problem with software. There's a lot of teams that who work on software that automates the work of 
different departments in the company or different customers. Uh, and that's what the software does. But then the team itself, we saddle ourselves with new administrative work to build and deploy and monitor the software. And we do that manually. And, uh, and the software that relieves our customers of administrative work ends up saddling us with more administrative manual work of constantly test and retest and produce a build and deploy a build and oh why did it break um it's it's kind of the the problem of the cobbler's kids don't have shoes because the software really makes other people's lives easier the the devops environment makes the development team's life easier and so um and so that's the that's the interesting conundrum now a little bit a little bit about myself um some some hobbies that have you know kept on kept on going this year is uh the dirt bike enduro racing i had another race about a, a week and a half ago um i don't expect to do well it's just uh, kind of like the, the beer league um but th that's fun out here and uh, that's that's my boy uh changing the tube in his dirt bike tire so we have fun at that and actually uh, my youngest eight-year-old daughter she did her first juniors race a week and a half ago so that was fun um, all right, our quick agenda. Um, we're going to talk about the, the challenge of DevOps. We're going to talk about the, the structure of a pipeline and what a pipeline is and then how to get started. Um, and everything that I, that I talk about, even though tools are involved and products are involved, it's never about the tools. And I'm going to frame everything and the examples in with uh, Azure DevOps services. However, if if I was talking with a group of people that only did Java programming and they were using JetBrains IntelliJ and they were using Jenkins or TeamCity, all of these principles would be 100% transferable because uh, it's how you use the tools, not the magic tool that you have to use in order to, in order to do this well. Um, there, are some, there are some of the techniques that I look back on to when I originally learned some of these and it was, uh, it was back in 2005 and the tooling was cruisecontrol.net with XML NANT files for builds. Um, and now there, there's a lot of progress along the way and a lot of learning that people in the industry have, have achieved and then shared with others. But I just wanna encourage you, it's, it's not about the magic tool, it's about how we apply the tools and making sure that we have every piece uh, every every piece of the DevOps environment in place. And I'm going to talk about all of the pieces of a DevOps environment. Uh, now, Dave, just to make sure, uh, how, how long are you going to give me before you cut me off? Oh, I have to watch it there because I'm, I'm DevOps Dave because I'm on the DevOps account, but I'm Tim. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. With that. Yeah, it's all right. No worries. It's all right. It's understandable. Um, uh, we go normally till about quarter past seven, so and we allow times of questions, so probably okay, seven o'clock. Okay, 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a free offer, if anyone's interested, um, I have clearance from the, uh, the deal with the publisher. Uh, if, if you'd like the electronic copy of my latest book, just send me an email, um, Jeffrey at clear measure.com. And I'll be happy to send you a full electronic copy of the book. If you want a print book, you can buy it anywhere, anywhere you can buy books online. Uh, but, uh, um, I'd be happy to happy to give anyone here, anyone here, an electronic copy of the book. Uh, also, the Azure DevOps podcast is is something that uh, Tim mentioned, and that's fun. Uh, I think I just interviewed Jeff Fritz yesterday. That show will come out next week, and uh, I've started a new video podcast just in a different format. Uh, we're on episode number seven, so it is quite fresh, and it's just a five to ten minute uh, video podcast. Um, taking questions from the community and just answering questions and giving small tips. So that's another, that's another podcast that's out there. You can search, uh, search around for it. All right. So our agenda, we're going to talk about the seven key elements of a DevOps environment and the DevOps environment. Uh, if you, if you just go back in time before the word DevOps was ever coined, uh, it was, I think it was said for the first time in 2010, but uh, you go back in time and people just call it, hey, this is our development environment. Uh, it, is, it is the environment that we create for ourselves so that we can move fast 
and make sure that we have a handle on quality and get and get software out. And and the goal, you can see the fruit of an effective DevOps environment in that if there is a, uh, let's say, let's say there was a spelling error. No, I'll do a simpler one. Um, if you find that a field in your in your database or data store, or whatever whatever it is, you find that it's length of 10 and you need to move it to length of 15. Someone can say, hey, you know, we need to do that in the morning. And a couple hours later, it's in production. That is the fruit of, of an effective DevOps environment or, or any targeted change, a spelling error somewhere on a screen or just a little tweak here and there. Um, now, obviously feature development, just depending on how big the feature is, you, you know, there may be a lot of parts, but things that are very straightforward, uh, a, a effective DevOps environment should yield you the ability to take a very straightforward change and reliably get it out to production uh, in a very short period of time, right? Uh, obviously changes to logic and other things, you, you wanna uh, have more testing, but, uh, but the simpler things, that, that's the fruit, to be very straightforward and quick. So um, we're gonna we're gonna blaze through these seven different areas: things that you do before you even set your hands on the keyboard to start coding, the structure of your version control system, uh, the 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 build structure, and the two different types of builds that you need in a DevOps environment, uh, where full system testing fits in, where manual testing I'm calling user experience testing fits in, and I don't like man I don't like the word manual testing because it's so vague. Um, different types of people could manually test and then talk about production releasing. And then uh, finally, how to know how our software is doing in production. I call that telemetry observation. Um, nice, nice, fancy words thrown in. All right. So the pipeline is a term that a lot of people are using. And this is why I like that word is because of the analogy. In a pipeline, we typically think about water, or oil or some type of liquid that flows through a pipeline. Let's take, let's take water. Uh, we have pipes that go into our house that we turn on, we turn on a faucet and we get water coming out, let's say the kitchen sink. And so some of the things that we want out of that pipeline is when we turn on the faucet on the kitchen sink, we want water to always be there. If we turn on the faucet and there's no water, there's a problem. Also, if we turn on the faucet and the water comes out and it's brown, that's a problem. So we want it to be reliable. Uh, oh, also if we turn it on and it's dripping, that's a problem. If we turn it on and it's blasting out like a fire hose going everywhere, that's a problem. So we want smooth, consistent, reliable flow, water pressure. We want it to be reliably clean um, and, and always available on demand whenever we need it. If, if we turn on the water and the water company says, Hey, no problem. I'll get you that. That water will come through uh, tomorrow. <laughs> That's a problem. So now, th think about think about software. Um, the pipeline is our customers' faucet. If they ask for a change, and uh, now I'll, I'll talk about internal software because typically software, um, either you could have departmental customers inside your company or external customers. But either way, sometimes they they. There's product management that says, hey, this is the change, let's push out. But then a lot of times customers will ask for a change. Either, however it comes, they're asking for water. They're turning on the faucet and say, I'd like some water, please. And so you wanna be able to get that change to them very quickly and have changes constantly flowing through. Um, also, uh, the brown water is, is analogous to software defects. Uh, the water in the pipeline needs to be pure at all times. It's not, uh, it, it's not a workable solution to say, we're going to have a mega filter right inside the faucet at your kitchen sink and all of the water in the pipe is going to be brown, but don't worry, we're going to filter all out all of that stuff right there at the kitchen sink at your faucet. So don't worry, it'll come out clean. I don't think in the software world that doesn't work either. Every section of the piping must have clean water. Every part of the process in, needs to have defect free software, okay? We can't just let the defects flow through and expect to catch them all at the end right before it goes to the customer. So I really like the analogy of the pipeline because it, it, it has all these similarities. And so from a measurement perspective, if you're in the management chair, you wanna measure 
your water pressure, which is your throughput. How many features, how many issues, how many cards, whatever you call them, work items, how many are going through every hour, every day, and, and that's your throughput. And then you also wanna measure your quality, the impurities in the water, which is your, your software defects. Uh, how many defects get through to a stage that you wouldn't like them not to get through. All right, so, so the pipeline really is a great analogy. Um, and it, it, it reminds us that we don't want a stop and start process. And so uh, Scrum has gotten really popular, but Scrum is a start and stop process. Now it's, Scrum is great for communication uh, between departments. It gives definite rhythms, intentional communication. It gives a lot of great things. But when it comes to the engineering side of software, um, the uh, batching up a, a bunch of software and then going for two weeks and releasing all of that stuff at the end of two weeks, um, it, it, it's helped a lot of teams when compared to doing that process over a three to six month or longer period. But the, uh, the, the people who are jumping into DevOps have realized that if they take the, the Scrum structure, if you adopt that, but then layer on the engineering um, capability to have one day sprints if you wanted to, uh, it just makes an advantage because even though an external customer may not be able to absorb a release, but once every week, or once every two weeks, as long as the team is able to deliver the release at any time, there's a great advantage. And so it's perfectly fine. The customers, they say, you know, no, I don't want a new version of the software every day. Please don't do that to me. That's fine. But the problem becomes when they say, hey, we need a fix or we need to change. And can you make that change now? And you say, oh, we can do that in the next cycle, which is scheduled for two weeks from now. And you have no ability to even deliver something the same day. So, so regardless of when you actually are going to do production releases, uh, we want we want you to have the ability to do it same day. Okay, this is the, the this is a uh, a DevOps architecture poster that that we we've been using for some time, and it's it's the top third of a big high resolution poster. And I know some of the text is hard to read, but um, but if 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 anyone would like the full high resolution PDF of this DevOps poster, just send me an email. I'll be happy to, to get the full thing sent over to you. Uh, just, just a quick view at what the full poster looks like is that you can hang it up on your wall or send it to your team. But um, this gives the, the, the main stages of a DevOps environment. And you see on there, you see version control system, you see uh, Azure DevOps services monitoring sort the version control system for a continuous integration build and then taking release candidates and putting them in package management and then moving it over to the pipeline uh, structure. And, and, and there's three different environments. Uh, by the way, the, the product logos are some of the most common and uh, high powered products in the, in the DevOps space. We find them used uh, quite a bit. So we kind of put them on here as examples, uh, but any DevOps no fewer than three environments. That's the minimum. And that's because there are three distinct types of environments and you need at least one of each. It's perfectly fine to have more than one of each type, but you need at least one of each of them. You have the production environment, which everyone knows. Then backing off from that, you have a manual testing environment. We tend to call it UAT for user exceptions testing that a customer or customer proxy looks at it and says, yes, that's gonna work for us. So please get it over to production. And then backing off from that, um, we call that the TDD environment for functional automated testing. Um, but that environment, there's no reason for any humans to ever touch it. That is meant just for the automation. Every deploy comes, we deploy automatically to it, run a system, run it, run a, a barrage of automated tests that, that must be run on a fully deployed instance of the software. And then that, that build succeeds on that deployed environment. And then it's ready for the UAT environment where a human would actually set eyes on it. Uh, it makes it, it's useless to push a build to the UAT environment for a human to look at if something functional is broken. 
So that's the purpose of the first uh, environment. And, and um, we've kind of, we've been calling it the TDD environment to invoke the spirit of test-driven development. Okay. So let's keep on going. This is another view of the overall process. And, and there's really a, a a 12 step process here. And it's kind of three different tranches as well. The top four steps in your overall process are all about figuring out the right thing to do. And um, we've realized that there are four different types of decisions that everyone needs to make, whatever you call them. I don't, I don't care what you call these stages, but we've identified that there's four types of decisions that everyone needs to make so that a developer can set hands on the keyboard and type out some code. And the first one, uh, conceptual definition is, what the heck is this? What, um, what's our goal? Why are we doing this? What are we trying to accomplish? And then once we've defined that, then we move it along and can figure out the user experience design, which is answering the question, what should it look like? What should a person's usage experience be? Either it's a screen and they can see something with their eyeballs and they can click on some drop downs, text boxes and, and press a button. That's fine. We need a, a quick wireframe of what that what the layout's going to be. Or maybe it's just a back end job that moves data from application A to application B. And the only thing that we're deciding is how quickly do we need that data? Is it is it you know once every hour that data refreshes? Is that fine? Or does this have to be once every 30 seconds? That is a user experience decision. It's, it's ask, answering the question, what should a human's experience be if this behavior is added to the software? Okay, so that's, that's that stage. And then the next one is technical design. And that's uh, answering the question, is the current architecture sufficient for this new software behavior? Or do we need to discover an, an additional architectural element to add to the software? Do we need a new design pattern? Or is there a well-established pattern for this type of thing? And we need to specify, hey, just do it the same way. We have a pattern for that. It's making that decision. And again, if it's just, just, if it's just another of something we've done many, many times before, then that phase is a rubber stamp just confirming, yep, it's the same as before. Do it that way. Move it along. And then the fourth decision is uh, once it's done, what are the test scenarios that we need to, to, uh, to go through to make sure that this new behavior works properly. And, and with, with every new software behavior, there tends to be a happy path and there tends to be an exception path. And in some other cases with some rules, validation, uh, some different types of branching logic, there may be you know half a dozen different scenarios that we need to run this through to make sure that we covered everything. But either way, this stage uh, forces us to intentionally uh, think about the different scenarios that need to be tested and list those out. Not complicated, just simple bullet list, list out the name of the scenario and oftentimes that, that's enough. And then uh, as, we, as the code is developed, each of those test scenarios becomes a full system test case. And then, then forevermore, we have good automated test coverage of the new behaviors that we just introduced to the software. So those are the four types of decisions that we need to make it, it, before code is written. Now, if we don't do that, and there's a lot of places where these four different types of decisions are either not done or they're not called out as being distinct. And, and if we don't intentionally make those decisions, then a developer is gonna get hands on the keyboard, is gonna start typing out code, and then is gonna realize in their head that they need to know something. Either, oh, what's this screen supposed to look like? I don't have a wireframe, that's the obvious one. And the developer is just gonna make up a wireframe on their own on the spot. Uh, or um, data is moving from application A to application B, What's the expected time? Is it every 30 seconds or is it every 30 minutes? If the developer doesn't know, the developer is just going to make an assumption. Now, different developers have different experience levels, different personalities, and have differing uh, thresholds at which they stop their work and have a conversation. Okay. And so um, uh, if, if, if there's team norms of stopping and having conversations, then you may be able to fill in the gaps. But there's a tremendous amount of time wasted in 
oh, I thought that I would, I thought this was ready to implement. Now I have to stop and I have to go back to a design discussion to fill in the gaps for some of these decisions that, that really need to be made before the software can be implemented. So it is a suck on productivity. It is a productivity killer to think, oh, I'm gonna implement, oh, now I have to stop and go have a design discussion. And the agile software movement has, has promoted the idea of having all these conversations. And it is a tremendous improvement over just making an assumption and going forward or not talking to people and then implementing the wrong thing. For sure, it's an, it's an absolute improvement, but it is still um, an unnecessary efficiency drain to get into implementation and then realize I'm missing a decision. I have to stop and have that conversation and then go back. We can go faster. And this is how to go faster by recognizing that there are four different types of design decisions to be made in order to be ready for implementation. If we can just intentionally make them. Um, and it, again, if every issue is small, then all of these decisions can be made very quickly and things get moving quickly. Um, the after after development, I'm, I'm going to talk about each of the stages later with uh, with how to structure source control, the builds, how to store artifacts, and then uh, how to how to deploy through the different types of environments. But this is the overall structure of a process. And again, I haven't even started talking about to, the tooling yet. Um, now, Azure Boards is great at representing all this stuff. But you know what? If I'm if I'm honest, there's all all kinds of tools that pre present a Kanban style board that people are successfully using. But let me show the, uh, the general structure of your work tracking board. And again, the column headers, I don't care what you call these, rename them, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you have a column for each, um, for each concept. And uh, most of the Azure boards included, most of the tools that present a Kanban board capability start you out with, you know, backlog or not started and then an in progress column and then a done column. And if you leave it that way, then, then you have no idea why something is, is taking a long time. It may be in progress, you know, great. I know it's not done and I know that we've started, but that's all I know. I don't know exactly what is taking so long. And so when we break them up into the individual unique activities, then we actually know where our bottleneck is because it's meaningful to say that there's no cards in any of the columns except development. And then we say, yeah, we're, we, we've started a whole bunch of coding implementation. All of them are well-defined. We know exactly what it is. We're just taking a long time to develop. It's also meaningful to say that Nothing is in development, but all of it is in functional testing, meaning all the code is written, but maybe we're in a pull request process, or maybe we've, we've uh, put it in, a, maybe it's, it's running in a test driven development environment, but some of the tests are failing and it's broken and it's not yet ready to go to user experience validation, which is the UAT environment. Um, and it's, but what I find more often than not, when people have a board with not started, in progress and done. And the in progress column is big and things are taking a long time and they're, and they're being asked the question, hey, what's taking so long and we dig in? Oftentimes what I'm finding is that one of the design columns to the left here, those activities are actually the bottleneck. That something has been moved to in progress the developers go to it and start having conversations about how it should be done. Maybe they write a little bit of code but they've stopped implementation and they're trying to have conversations to clarify what the heck we're doing or we know what we need to do, but, but how should we do it? Which is the technical design. Hey, we need to, we need to add some architectural element to the software. If we're going to do this type of, or this changes something, we, what pattern are we going to use? We find that the, the four columns on the left, more often than not, those become the bottlenecks. And if we don't have any of those represented in our work tracking, then you may, you may interview the developers and say, hey, what are we waiting on? Oh, we don't, we don't know how we're going to do this. Or we thought we were going to do it this way, but that's not going to work. Or we're still waiting on an answer for stuff from so-and-so. And so if we, can, if we can call out these as columns in our Kanban board, then 
whoever whoever uh, on your team is doing project management, they can see at a glance where the work is. And we find that this is really empowering for developers who who tend not to immediately talk about process when they're in conversations, they tend to talk about techie stuff. And, and if, if something is stacked up in user experience design and you know, someone's saying, Hey, when's that going to be done? Well, let's talk about that. We need so-and-so to make a decision about how, how, how somebody's going to use this feature or what should this screen look like? How many fields, what should the fields on this screen be? How should it look? So we can move that along, or you know, one of those one of those columns being a backlog. Okay. Now, also, um, you can see in technical design and in functional design, we have a uh, work breakdown or decomposing of a particular item. What we found to be really, really effective is to have a standard of not moving something into development unless you reliably believe that you can get it done, that it can be implemented in one to two days of coding effort. Uh, what we found is that if, if you don't have a clear line of sight and, and high confidence that this is gonna be done in one or two days, then it is a uh, very likely sign that there's something that we don't understand about it. Um, now, definitely, if, 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 you, if you say, oh, this is gonna take two weeks to implement. Well, what that means is that we don't actually have it designed yet. Because once you, once you know what the design is, then uh, what happens is we end up decomposing it into multiple items. And let, let's, say it, let's say it did take two weeks. Well, then what's likely is you end up decomposing it down to five to 10 items. And each of the five to 10 items are then known. And each of the individual ones are a one to two day effort. This process has cured um, bad estimates. Without, the, without this decomposing process, you get estimate, whether it's Fibonacci numbers or any, or any kind of estimation system, story points, planning poker, doesn't matter. Anytime someone starts talking about, oh, this will take three days, this will take five days, this will take the equivalent of two weeks, it's all wrong. What it translates to is, is I don't know, but let me get started on an I don't know task. And then, you know, a week goes by and says, hey, how are we doing? Oh, I think I need another two weeks. And then two weeks goes by. Oh, I think I need one more week. And another week goes by. Yeah, I need a few more days. And you look back, why did we spend six weeks on this? And the customer, whoever that is in your organization says, if I'd have known that you were going to spend six weeks on that, I never would have asked you to do it. Now you, you acted like you had an open checkbook. Like you, you have your, my wallet in your hand. Why did you do this to me? And they're frustrated because they feel like they didn't have a choice in the matter because they were strung along. And so this process really cures that eventuality because in the, the, the technical design column, we're asking ourselves is, hey, do we know what we're doing on this item? If the answer is yes, then that item should be, broken down into some number of items that each one, everybody can look at it and say, oh yeah, I can get that done in one day or, oh yeah, uh, two days max. But no, I, I understand exactly what to do and I can get it done in one to two days of, of coding effort. Um, now, what we find then is the estimates are either a one or a two. And then you just count up the number of items that are going into the development column and we felt we found that to to really simplify the the process of estimating and looking at this board and saying how much work is actually on the board for the team. Um, and so all these elaborate estimation systems that have come and gone in the industry, you just don't have to use them because you've solved the problem for a little bit further upstream. Okay. Um, now. Uh, each of, these, each of these columns should have a clear owner. For example, conceptual definition, there should be some person, some type of analyst in your organization who's responsible for defining the business goals and what you're going, user experience design, somebody whose job it is to get that item, to get that card uh, defined, add whatever information to it and move, move it to technical design. Um, 
and I've kind of given descriptions of what the activity is in each of these columns. But the owner of each of the columns, when, when a card comes over, a quick quality control check is making sure that the work artifacts from the previous column are inside that card, that issue. In Azure Boards, everything's an issue. Uh, by the way, I'm a big fan of the new process template that came out in the last year, the, the basic process template. You've had the Agile and the Scrum and the CMMI process template. Um, but I've, I, I really prefer the one that's labeled basic and it has just one work item type, which is an issue. And you know, if you're using GitHub, GitHub, everything's an issue. Uh, but in Azure Boards, every issue can be broken down into tasks and every issue can also um, have test scenarios added to it, uh, which I think that's, um, I love the simplicity there. Uh, okay, so zoom in. Let's go to, let's go to version control structure. Um, this is generally the decomposition structure of any version control repository. Every versioned software application needs to have its own Git repository. Every software system tends to be broken down into multiple versioned applications. And it's, and it's just fine for a software system to have, you know, 10 different applications that, that make it up, but each of those applications need their own Git repository. You, you, all of the tooling in the industry is, is built, designed and tested with one assumption in mind that whatever is in a single Git repository is gonna be built, tested, packaged and deployed together. So if you, have, if you have multiple Visual Studio solutions with multiple applications in one Git repository, you're gonna be tripping on yourself trying to put your DevOps automation in place. But if you have one Visual Studio solution in one Git repository, and, and by the way, it's fine for one Visual Studio solution to have a web application, a backend job that's, that's uh, you know, a batch job or an Azure function or a web job, and even a, 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 a SQL Server database or a data store, if all of those logically are one application, one versioned application that just happens to be deployed, ha have multiple processes that are all deployed together, that's still one versioned application. But if you decompose a system into multiple independently deployable things, well, you need, you need multiple Git repositories. As long as you do that, the rest of the tooling that's available in the industry is gonna work really nice for you. But that's the key thing to remember. Only one uh, logical application per Git repository. All right, here is the structure of a build process. Um, there are two types of builds. One's the private build, one is the integration build, but they both, uh, they both have the Venn diagram, mostly overlapping steps. The integration build effectively runs the private build and then does packaging, okay? So the integration build does everything that the private build does, but then also packages that, uh, that build for release. And uh, the first steps, a build is just a test. So if you're familiar with test-driven development and, and the arrange, act, assert pattern of an automated test, a build is a higher level automated test. In the arrange category, we want to clean up any artifacts, set our environment, don't let any temporary files or previously deployed assemblies in the build directory. Um, and then we want to stamp a version number, get set up, and then migrate the database, which is which is in the category of set up our environment. Meaning if, if the simple, I love to talk about a very simple architecture that everybody has at least one instance of, which is some web application on top of a relational SQL Server database. No matter what else you have, you at least have one of those somewhere and everybody understands that. Um, and so creating a local database and the build server, creating a database on the build server is uh, setting up the environment so that it can do uh, the rest of the build. The act category is just compiling, translate the source code into executable code. And then the assert stage is running your different test suites. In your, in your private build and integration build, you run your unit tests and your integration tests. And then, um, and then the integration build will continue on and do some additional steps like static code analysis and packaging. 
Now, for mature teams who've been using static code analysis for a while, uh, you'll probably want to take that and move it over to the assert column so that you start failing your build if it if it doesn't meet the static analysis rules that you set in place for your team. But we find that's a level of maturity. And it's just, it's good information if you're just starting to adopt it. And then as you get to a, a norm about um, some of those rules, like actually failing, if you, uh, if you fail one of those rules, then you can move it over to the assert column. But that's the general structure of a build. It's not rocket science. What's really interesting is in how we automatically set up our environment in the arrange column and what kinds of tests we're able to add for ourselves. For example, um, the, the setting up of the environment should automatically set up a computer to be able to run the rest of the build. If you need a specific uh, dependency running locally, then your private build script should set up that dependency on the computer so that it enables developers who are new to the team, or if you're setting up a new computer to be able to clone the Git repository, bring it down, execute a command line, the uh, private build, and it just work, which is different from, let me get, let me get the source code. Oh, wait a minute. I need this dependency. Let me go and install this. Okay. Let me go and install that. Let me make sure that this tool is in the right directory. That tool is in the right directory. Okay. Now the private build will work. If the private build needs something, it should check for its existence. And if it's not there, it should put it there. And with tools like Chocolatey for installing software, we, we had one, uh, one client's piece of software that needed the old uh, Microsoft Access Runtime because it ingested an Access Database file as a piece of incoming data from one of the data sources. So guess what? Software needs the Access Runtime locally, which under the covers is COM components, but it's gotta be there. And so we just check for the existence. If not, run the Chaco install command at the beginning of the build, boom. Now anybody that runs a build, it's just automatic. Okay, so you want it, you want things to be automatic like that. Uh, get rid of the manual steps. Okay, um, I, I think I did see, I'm, I'm sure I missed some, but a, a question, are you a fan of trunk-based development for branching? Um, I haven't specifically talked about branching, but um, I, am a fa I am a fan of branching and I'm a fan of the simplest branching structure that's gonna work for your team. And in a lot of cases, that means that the simplest most basic feature branching works fine for a lot of people where you have your master branch. And if there's a card that comes through in development, you branch off of master to do that. You do your development, you do a pull request, um, which I'll come back to, and then, and then it goes back in, which effectively is trunk-based development. If you go and look up the article on trunk-based development, the naming is terrible because the entire article describing trunk-based development I would have renamed it to feature branch based development because trunk based development calls for branching for every feature, which if you just listen to the name trunk based development, you think, oh, you do your development on the trunk, but in trunk based development, no development is done on the trunk. All development is done on a branch. So it's a really bad name, but yes, I'm a fan of it because it calls for feature branching for everything. All right. Let's get into release packaging. So let's say our application has um, has these different uh, projects in it, and I'm ignoring class libraries. Each of the deployed uh, processes needs to have a package. The package format is a NuGet package, very simple. Um, it's a NupKeg, um, and those those files essentially are renamed zip files. If you were to rename a NupKeg package, to .zip, you could open it with a zip tool. It's just, it just it's, it's based on that. So if we have a web application, well, guess what? That's deployable, it needs a package. If we have an offline job of some type, well, it's gonna be deployed to a separate process. So that's a package. If we have a SQL Server database, well, it's gonna be deployed to a SQL Server somewhere, even Azure SQL, and so that's a package. And our acceptance tests, our full system tests, guess what? That has to be deployed to a process in the environment in order to run, that's a package. So this type of structure, you'd have four different NupKeg files that make up your release candidate. And you wanna name all those files with the same version number um, so that they are a, a release candidate 
with a set of four files, four Nutkeg files. This is what the Azure pipeline is gonna look like at its most basic form for a three-stage uh, deployment pipeline. It's never gonna be simpler than this. You don't, want, you don't want your stages to be stacked on top of each other because that means that you have uh, three deployment targets, but you haven't actually arranged it into a pipeline. You want it to be sequential. And you see the TDD environment has that hourglass that says 100%. That means that a test suite ran against it and 100% of the tests passed. And a lot of people want that little approve button in production that we find that to be pretty useful. Um, I'm gonna show you the structure of what one of these stages looks like. I'm gonna show you the TDD environment and, um, and uh, this structure here is for the TDD environment. Um, I have been keeping an eye on the YAML based uh, the YAML based builds in Azure DevOps. And we haven't gotten to the point where we've started to recommend them for our clients because um, the, the design experience that they talked about, you know, a year and a half ago when they came out with YAML, with the YAML build structure, they, they're still working on it. Um, and some, some people have left the team and it's kind of been left. And so uh, the discoverability of these tasks in YAML just isn't there. And also there are some of these tasks like sending, uh, retrieving packages from Azure artifacts that you have to know the private GUID ID of a particular package and actually put in a GUID into your YAML. And so those kinds of things, um, even for experts, make the YAML implementation just really, really tricky and opaque. And so for that, we found that it, it's kind of simpler to maintain just using the, the visual designer, uh, but it's your choice. But I'm gonna show you the visual designer here. This is the structure and you see there's a pattern emerging. If it, in, uh, it, this is even simplified, if we have even uh, a SQL Server database, a web application and full system tests, then um, the same pattern emerges. We we grab, I'll use my mouse here. We grab and download the package of a particular deployed component. Then we do some environment configuration and then we deploy that particular application component. And in this case, it's running our uh, SQL Server migrations tool to create the database. Next, grab the UI package for our web application, do some environment configuration and then deploy. And in this case, you have to do one more step, which is start the website. And it's the same pattern. Once it's done, we want to execute a built-in system health check. We want to call an endpoint that can make sure everything's online. Uh, Azure App Service has added, it's in beta, but has added support for the concept of a health check, which is a essentially just a web API endpoint that can be called. And it makes sure that the application responds back that it's healthy. But the, the, the magic is in how you implement that health check. If, if, the, if the connection string to the database is messed up and we can't get to it, the application's down. Come on, even if the web server's up, even if a static page can be served, that application is useless. Or if the schema, if there's a problem with the schema and something's failing, that application's effectively down. So, so the health check needs to kind of have a few lines of code that reach out and tickle every key dependency to make sure that they're there and they're online and that they're healthy. And before it comes back and says, yes, I am healthy as an application. But when we deploy, we want to make sure that we ask the application, hey, have you started up? Are you healthy? Before we allow, allow our tooling to report back that the deployment succeeded. Because if the application did not start up appropriately and doesn't report back health, then this deployment should report back a failure. And we want the tooling to record that. It does us no good if we say, oh yeah, the application deployed. And then I go and try to use it and it blows up in my face. That does nobody any, any good. All right, the next stage after it's deployed in the TDD environment and it's started up and it's healthy is we grab our full system exceptions test suite and we run it. So we grab the package, we do some environment configuration like pushing in some config values and then the deploy of this is actually running those tests, which for web applications is gonna run tests that use Selenium, which is gonna open up 
open up a web browser, navigate to different screens in our web application and press buttons and text boxes. And then in the TDD environment, we just, in, if it's deployed to Azure, we delete the entire Azure resource group because we're done with that environment. We don't need that environment to be, to even live past that. Um, so that's, that's the general pattern there. For a, um, for defect removal, I'm going to, I'm going to flow through some of these and some of these, a lot of these uh, are in my book as well. Um, there, there is a defect removal uh, pattern that can add on to all of this by creating your pull request after the acceptance tests have, have succeeded in a deployed environment, as opposed to putting your pull request before the first deployment. If you don't know yet, if the change that you made is going to deploy and pass all your tests, then it's probably not a, uh, you probably aren't ready yet for a pull request. Um, th this is another view of release candidate packaging. Um, the key thing here is that every deployment use the same release candidate set of artifacts. Uh, there is no such thing as building to UAT or building to production. We want to build once and then take that uh, release candidate and deploy multiple times. Um, one of the cool features in uh, Azure DevOps is the ability to do screenshots. And so these are full system tests and I'll, I'll, the next, I'll zoom in. This thing with the text boxes here, that's actually a screenshot of a screen in a web browser. And we can take screenshots of what the application looks like and tag them so that when one of these full system tests fails, we have a screenshot of exactly what the screen looked like. We don't have to spend tons of time trying to reproduce it just to see a screen that blew up with a stack trace or with an error message that we can say, oh, I know exactly what happened. Because oftentimes if you see what the screen looks like, you know what happened. So that's a good pattern. Every step that one of these full system tests uh, makes, just take a screenshot and save it. St you know, storage space is free and it's a really effective tool. But the key in your pipeline is to make sure that you don't do anything in production for the first time. You do more things in the TDD environment than you do in UAT in production. Every single time, you're going to migrate your database, you're going to deploy the application, run the health check, you're going to load static data, um, like for drop downs and things like that. But uh, in the TDD environment, we're going to recreate the environment from scratch in Azure. We're going to recreate the database from scratch in Azure. We're going to run the acceptance test, which is adding and loading and destroying data. And we're just going to let that deploy go completely unattended. We're not even going to watch it. Um, and, but then it, by the time you get over to production, we do less. We never want to do something in production that we haven't done many times with many different builds in upstream environments. That's a key principle. And I'll, I'll, I'll end on telemetry. Um, if, uh, if you'll allow me a few minutes over, um, we'll end on telemetry and you want every deployed process to be pushing out logs and metrics and events to the same place. App, Azure Application Insights works great, uh, but you know there's a lot of other tools too, New Relic, Splunk, um, Stackify, great tools. And it really, you know, take your pick. But telemetry is more than just logs. You wanna supplement your logs with metrics and events. Uh, we oftentimes provide data warehouses and analytical reports to the users of our software systems but we don't make them for ourselves. This right here is effectively giving ourselves a data warehouse for how our application is behaving. Now with logs, with application insights, just by enabling it, we get some really interesting things. Like you, you see there's a SQL Server query that's automatically logged. We get stuff like that for free just by enabling application insights because it knows .NET applications. And that's great, but we want things like this. We want to be able to look at a chart and say, oh, our application is getting busier over time. How do I know? Because there are key events, key transactions in my application that I'm logging. This happens to be a dashboard from a car auction website. And you things have things, look at the top right, register new buyer command. 
uh, save by our command, uh, let's see, submit new add-on, submit new bid, all right? So we've just selected a few of the transaction types that our application does. We've used object-oriented programming to encapsulate transactions into objects. And then we emit events, custom events to application insights, it logs it. And so we can see over this period of time from July through August, that the number of, the amount of volume through this auction software went up considerably, but we can also see that we have cycles. Well, guess what? Car auctions are typically held on weekends, all right? Not smack in the middle of the week. So we have a cyclical effect, okay? But overall, we have an increased usage. And so um, that is because the software is taking events of what the software is doing and also sending those to Application Insights as custom events. Um, and and uh, I don't have any, a key example of metrics, but um, Application Insights and every other tool also has a concept of a custom metric. Um, in Blazor applications, it's really useful to find out how many people have the screen actively connected because Blazor has a concept of a connected circuit um, or a, it's a signal R connection, but how many actively connected clients. And that's a perfect use case for a custom metric so that you can see on your dashboard, oh, I have either two or I have 500 or 5,000 and know what that metric is at any point in time. Whereas you go spelunking in log files, just trying to figure out what's going on. So you wanna augment your logs with custom events and custom metrics so that you can truly create dashboards that answer questions about, hey, what's my software doing? And what are the people who are using my software doing? Um, now, another interesting thing, uh, how Azure DevOps kind of integrates with, uh, with application insights. See these little green check marks across the top? Each one of those represents a production deployment. And if I were to hover or click on one of those green dots, then it pops up exactly what that release was, including a, a link to click directly over to that production deployment in Azure DevOps. So all of this, when you, when you take the entire Azure suite and put it together, it has some really nice integration. And it's oftentimes interesting to see a change in one of your graphs of usage of the software or exception rate or whatever it happens to be, and then realize, oh, that happened right after a deployment, meaning, hey, things got better right after our deployment. Great, we wanted that to happen. Or, whoa, what just happened? This is terrible, what did we do? You know, either way, it's a really good piece of data. All right, that brings us to the end. Uh, a reminder, um, if you'd like a, a free copy of the book, it's, it's yours for the taking. Um, and Tim, should I look for questions come through? Um, we'll take it uh, take over from here, Jeff, and, and okay. uh, fire through them with you. Yeah, yeah, nice one. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, that was awesome, and uh, I love your energy and some great tips um, in there. That's great. So, um, yeah, I think there's a couple of questions. They're mainly from me and Tim. So I don't know if anyone else has a question, please um, post it or, or feel free to come off mute and you know and ask a question if you've got one for Jeffrey. If not, I have I have a couple. I have one from Tim and one from myself that we can ask quickly. Ask yours first from me, Will. Yeah. Oh, hang on, someone's got one. Yeah, we've got one from Chris. Do you want to come off mute and ask your one, Chris? Or I can ask it for you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just curious to know, um, with uh, GitHub Actions and the sort of Microsoft's focus on um, moving that way, I wonder just thoughts uh, on Azure DevOps pipelines and, and GitHub Actions and sort of uh, when to, you know, the difference, when to favor, when should we move, when, when new Greenfield development, should we be looking at GitHub Actions? Uh, I think that you should be looking at GitHub Actions and monitoring GitHub Actions. Um, in my opinion, it is something that is inevitably going to be ready at some point in time for application development, um, but they're, they're still working on that. Uh, 
let's see, when was it? Chris Patterson, who's a um, one of the one of the architects, or I think it's his title, maybe program manager. Um, he uh, he is at yeah about what was it six months ago? I interviewed him on the Azure DevOps podcast. If you want to look, it's episode ninety five, and I asked him point blank, when is GitHub Actions going to be ready for application development? And and basically he indicated that, hey, yes, it will be ready. They're working towards that, um, but they've got some key partners that need, need integration. Now, GitHub Actions is absolutely brilliant for open source libraries, like absolutely brilliant. Um, it has everything that it needs. The production environment for an open source library is essentially nougat.org, right? That's the production environment. Run the tests, push it up to nougat.org. But in applications, we're dealing with database schemas and other data storage providers. We're dealing with dependencies, uh, environment creation, um, and, and running, running of tests of complex test suites and analyzing the results and tests that somehow over time start taking up more time and we need visibility to it so we can tweak our, our test suites so we keep our build times down. There's a lot of capabilities that um, you know, products like Team City, Jenkins, Azure Pipelines, and others have built up over time. That GitHub Actions just it, it needs some more schedule runway in order to add on those features that are that are just basic when it comes to application development teams. So my answer is you should be watching it, but um, for those who have tried to do it, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of roll your own at the moment. And if you just want to use a tool and get going and move fast, then that's, the, uh, that's the status. Just kind of watch for it. Cause there's a lot of effort being put towards it. Thanks Jeffrey. Ooh. Thanks Jeffrey. So I'll, I'll hit you up with my question. I actually corrected myself cause I, I kind of, uh, I looked up the docs I sent through and um, I found it interesting on, on the trunk-based development site. You're right, they, they do favor feature branches, short-lived feature branches. But um, as, as a coach, a lot of teams I've observed, I've seen, when you talk about flow of a pipeline, I found feature branching to be a real bottleneck and teams to spend a lot of time um, kind of in code reviews and back and forths and uh, uh, just an observation like my engineering days, it was mainly trunk-based development and you'd have agreed code standards that you'd all honor. And that seemed to work really well and you'd have really quick CI. And I don't know, as an observation, it seems to be, I don't know, a bit of a step backwards, I think, with these highly regulated and governed code reviews that are kind of stop-start. Um, but I don't know, what, what's your opinion on that? Well. Um, I, I, I went back and looked, I hadn't looked at trunkbaseddevelopment.com for a while. And, and they, the last time that I looked at it, it might've been a whole year ago or whatnot, or maybe I just missed it. I, you're, I didn't see the trunk based development for smaller teams section, which mm. does call for direct co commits on the trunk, but then the rest okay. of the so I, I don't know if they added that later or if I just missed it originally, but, um, yeah. I want to acknowledge that, that, yeah, if you go to the site now, it, it has two modes, okay. smaller teams or the, the scaled trunk-based development. I see. Okay. Um, I tend to prefer the one that's, that's labeled the scaled trunk-based development and the short-lived feature. I think that's the key short-lived meaning if that feature, if that branch is living more than two days, we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and because it should be for a particular card on your board and yeah. I, I push everybody to not be in development on a card for one or two days. And two is kind of like the exception. I really want one. And yeah. the two is a fallback because, you know, some things take a little bit longer. Or you don't get to it by the end of the day. Um, I, but, it, but it is a trade-off because here's what happens. If you are now, um, there was a, a large number of years that, that I personally spent with teams in subversion and not using feature branching, but it was directly committing directly onto Subversion's trunk branch, and uh, and then having CruiseControl.net you know, monitor that branch, and it was a big thing of I'm breaking the build. Why? Yeah. Because because I would have all of my code 
on my computer. And I knew that I better not commit it to the trunk because if it wasn't, because if it wasn't stable, if it wasn't ready, then I could potentially break one of my team members. I could break the build, break the rest of the team. And now, now the code base, the yeah. main, the, the trunk is unstable. Cause I just, I just put something in there that broke it. And so there'd be extra processes and, um, I think one of the team you heard people pass around a rubber duck. One of the teams had a little uh, plush doll of Homer Simpson, you know, it was like <laughs> put it around, and you know that that was the person who was integrating to the to the trunk. And what what caused that dynamic caused us to have more unchecked in code on our own computer because we were waiting until we were really done because there were consequences to breaking the rest of the team. Okay, now fast forward to Git source control instead of subversion or branching it to, and with Git source control for, if you're committing directly on the branch, you can, you can make smaller commits so that you can step forward on your own computer so that you have more granular rollback points. Cause sometimes we get the code into a state where like, golly, why isn't this working? This used to work. What did I do? And control Z, control Z. Oh shoot, it still doesn't fix it. Oh man, I totally hosed my code. What did I do? And yeah. you might have to roll back everything. Whereas if you've, if, if every time you get another automated test to green, if you're doing red, green refactor, every time you get green, boom, you make a quick commit. Yeah. And then you do the next one, you make a quick commit. And so if you mess things up, but you still mm. only have the code on your computer. Yeah. And so feature using branches, using short lived branches enables, enables a team dynamic where we push to our feature branch frequently. And so just in a passive way, our integration build is automatically running against our feature branch, giving us feedback that, oh, by the way, if you didn't know it, if you didn't run your private build, you know, diligently locally, guess what? You're unstable. And so it's just another piece of free feedback. And then I really like the, the, the pull request. Uh, Capers Jones, uh, mm. probably the, the world's best statistician and researcher of software projects. He, he has cataloged 19,000 projects going back several decades. He has, he has narrowed down to three quality control techniques that when put together uh, mm. yield like 99% defect removal uh, before before production and they are testing um, uh, static static code analysis and formal inspections and now mm -hmm. testing is best applied with three levels of test automation great we got that on the devops tooling um, static code analysis we've got the Roslyn code analyzers and we've got independent and we've got some great tools easy to drop in. The third one is formal inspections. I'm like yeah. formal inspections, what the heck is that? Mm -hmm. Well, the best implementation is a pull request. If the team were just to say, hey, let's meet, what's our simple checklist by which we hit the approve button on a pull request? Let's agree on what our checklist is. And then when someone hits approve, it's not just Hey, I looked at your code. Uh, yeah, you got all your tabs in the right spaces. Looks good to me, approve. No, no, no. it's what am I checking for? And if yeah. your team decides on a checklist, now you've elevated the pull request to a formal inspection. And um, research has shown that to really increase quality. So um, you need some place for a pull request to enable a, a, just a peer inspection. Mm -hmm. So, Jeff, can I uh, just ask a question here? So to me, I see two elements to a pull request. There's an element of a pull request, which is, as you were saying, that checklist. Have you got this? Have you got that? Have you got that? Then there's another element, which is sort of more like feedback loops, uh, and it can be opinion and things like that. Um, I, I just see a scheme one day for separating the two. What is a discussion to be had as an architectural group or whatever? not in a pull request because that's holding things up. Yeah. So when you have a pull request, it is based on a request of a pull of source code, meaning something something's already been implemented. So if we're going to have design discussions, well, and we put it there, I would think we've already killed our productivity because we've already spent time implementing something. And so the time for 
deciding, hey, how should this be implemented? Well, now we just created rework. I think the architectural and design discussions should be ahead of code being implemented. And discussions on uh, learnings and things like that afterwards us but log there's something we need to cover afterwards to continuously improve would you go there i think uh, yeah i think that that could go everywhere i mean anytime someone says hey i yes. learned something um because yeah sometimes we'll be implementing something and we'll realize oh shoot i see a comment that says to do we really should cover this other scenario later <laughs> you know, or something like that and um and if we're working on a particular issue on the board that has a particular branch and I'm going to submit it with a pull request, it also helps us stay disciplined to not do recreational development in other parts of the code base because we happened to see something. And instead we say, oh, I see something. Let me create a card real quick and put it on the board so I don't forget that. But what, what I found is um, if we don't have basic structures in place, developers, we naturally will just be going around the code. We'll be implementing things. We'll see something say, oh, let me just go and do that because I'm here. And let me go and do that because you're there. Well, that comes out if you have a pull request. Now someone's looking and saying, hey, what did you do? Oh, I just enabled this new behavior. Oh, and, and I fixed this. Oh, and I refactored that. And oh, I, oh, and I decided we should have a new day field in the database here you know so it, it oh, really yeah, that's an item on the checklist you, you don't do that stuff yeah yeah exactly so yeah. um but but if we have four different columns in the board around what we're doing how's it going to look how we're going to design it and then what does it mean to be done all the behavior scenarios then we have we have a we have a place for discussions about hey what should we do in the future what might we do we should probably, um, Will, I think 7.30 is, uh, we're a yeah. big way. For sure, yeah, no more questions coming in the chat there. So um, yeah, thank you uh, very much, Jeffrey. Like uh, if anyone has a burning question, um, you know, maybe you could hang, a, hang around for a moment. But um, yeah, that's really great. Thank you for taking your time out and getting up so goddamn early. I hope you've had some coffee. <laughs> Yeah, I have uh, 45 more minutes until I have to wake up my teenage daughter for school. Oh, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. Too. Oh, happy to, happy to. Very engaged group. We, good, good job keeping the community together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, group, yeah, group effort. effort. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cheers, guys. Nice Thanks, everyone. Evening. Okay, and we'll have the link to the talk up, the recording in the next few hours. Okay. See you, everyone. See Thanks, Jeffrey. Thanks, Tim. Cheers.